Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the webinar this evening, which has been hosted by AHGB Beef and Lamb. My name is Chloe McKee and I'm the Knowledge Transfer Officer for Beef and Lamb, and I'm delighted to bring you tonight's webinar on the impact of housing on the health of young stock. Our presenter this evening is Nick Gibbon from Belmont Farm and Equine Vets Limited, and Nick has worked as a vet for 10 years. So the plan of action is that Nick will run through a 30 minute presentation and then there will be time for questions at the end. You will all stay muted throughout the webinar, but if you would like to ask a question, then please type your question into the box on the side of your screen. If you can't see this box, you might have to click the orange arrow to open this box up. I will then ask Nick your questions once he's finished presenting. So hopefully we won't have any technical difficulties, but please bear with us if there are any. So I'll now hand over to Nick. Hello, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, uh, first, I think I start um, a little bit about me. Um, I'm a livestock vet. Uh, I practice, um, my practice is based in Herefordshire. Um, and we're really lucky in Herefordshire. We've got lots of calf rearers um, rearing, you know, quite a few systems rearing over a thousand calves. Um, uh, uh, clients that do more than that as well. And then, you know, a lot of people under there doing sort of 500 to 1,000 calves. Um, there's a lot of straw in Herefordshire um, and there's lots of mixed agriculture going on. Um, and historically, it's been a, a place that um, people have have been you know been able to buy calves from the marches and and from in, from into Wales and bring them over here and rear them. So there's a, there's a good calf rearing heritage and lots of it happening. Um, and that's one of the reasons why uh, two years ago I was asked by the AHDB um, to facilitate a discussion group um, for specifically for beef from dairy calf rearers. Um, and so we started out um, with a discussion group and we gathered a lot of data and things have slowly evolved. Um, and then at the, the end of that, they've um, asked me to do a webinar really looking at housing and discussing some of the findings from the discussion group. Um, so this evening, uh, I think I'll give a bit of background to this group of calf rearers, um, the key findings from their data. Um, how these things are relevant to other people rearing calves. Um, we'll look a little bit about um, housing design uh, and how that is affecting baby calves, what is unsuitable, what is suitable, um, potentially throw around some ideas of how to improve your housing. Um, and yes, the main focus is beef from dairy calf rearing, um, but the second part of the talk is relevant to all calves, um, so very much, you know, dairy heifers as well, um, or certainly calves on farm of origin. Um, so the calf rearing group uh, was made up of eight calf rearers, um, rearing between 500 and 1200 beef from dairy calves a year, um, generally from three weeks of age up into about 140, 150 kilograms. Um, they're largely supply chain, um, so contracts or, or buying and selling back into supply chains, um, and most of them were rearing from multiple sources. The key um, focus was discussion and learning amongst the, those in the group. Um, it was one of the more rewarding things I've done actually as a vet, is, is, is it's facilitating a discussion group, and a lot of the farmers appeared to get a lot out of it. Um, we had some great speakers on nutrition, housing, and disease. Um, coming and, and we had a chap come from the States to talk to us about housing and he had some really interesting ideas um, and then independent nutritionists um, and another vet um, talking about disease. So we had a good we had a good program. Part of the deal for the AHDB was that the calf rivers would record some data along the way. Um, so we recorded or we got them to record as much data as possible about each calf that went through each of the systems. Um, so we had calf breed, sex, disease, status, um, weight, arrival, weaning and leaving, um, farm of origin, ear tag, lots and lots of other variables were recorded by the farmers. Um, and this was really, the idea of this was for the AHDB to gather a bit of information into what's, what's going on, what the challenges are. Um, we got a good amount of data from the group. Uh, there were uh, 3,000 calves um, with weight data, so 3,000 calves with, with three weights, which is quite interesting to, to have a look at. And then there were 1,500 calves 
uh, with full health and weight data across the eight farms. Um, so we had 1,500 calves with some good start to finish um, records of incidents of pneumonia and scour and any other things that went wrong along the way. Um, and so there were lots of findings. We dra dragged out lots of um, information out of all the data and some of those findings had some statistical significance. Um, others were just, you know, a useful remark, really. Um, we spent a lot of time drilling into that data to have a look at some of the things that are affecting um, the, the calf rearing environment, the calf rearing business. Um, and some of the things were quite interesting. Um, obviously, our main focus, uh, my main focus as a vet was on, you know, disease incidents um, and the effect that disease incidents was having on, um, on ca the calf rearing process. So is it affecting growth rate? Is it affecting days on farm, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and some of the calf rears or some calf rears I've heard sort of previously remark that pneumonia, yes, it costs to treat. And yes, there is a risk of um, losing the calf, but it doesn't necessarily have the cost um, that we talk about in terms of growth rates. Well, even in those 1500 calves, it was quite obvious that calves with pneumonia were staying on farm for longer than calves without. So pneumonia in the calf rearing environment has having actually quite a big cost um, in terms not only of treatment and potential losses, but also in, in its lost efficiency. So in the group, um, the, you know, the group in the 1500 calves that had health data, if you'd had half the number of cases of pneumonia, they could have reared another 200 calves um, in their in the 12 month period. So if you think about it in terms of lost days on farm against your fixed cost and variable cost, et cetera, then um, or or lot or or a um, a lost potential, then you know there's considerable cost in the calf rearing environment of a case of pneumonia. So focus really has to be on preventing pneumonia. Other things we found is that certain categories of calf onto farm were at greater risk of developing pneumonia. Um, so very small calves, um, as this graph shows, had a higher high pneumonia rate. Um, heavy calves were at less risk of get, developing pneumonia. Um, and we spent a lot of time drawing things like this out of the data. Um, one of the other things that we looked at was uh, the makeup of the batch. So the number of sources uh, in each batch. Um, and this was quite an interesting uh, finding. It was, it's, it's obvious in hindsight, but the, the, this was quite stark in that uh, if you look on the left-hand side of this graph here, the few groups that we had through um, that were only coming from one or maximum two sources had many, many fewer cases of pneumonia in them compared to the, the the groups that went through that were made up of big numbers of sources. Um, <coughs> and this is purely because the numbers of variety of each of the individual viruses and your common cold equivalents, um, the different varieties and, and, and um, types of mycoplasma, et cetera. If you mix up 10 different farms, you've got potential high, high, you know, high, high variety there. So potential for calves that are naive or not immune um, to come across diseases that they've never seen before and therefore develop disease um, is much greater. And so that was quite an interesting um, exercise. It's kind of obvious. It's nice to see it in black and white. So what do we do with this information? Um, so we basically built a model um, that was going to try and sift between all the um, all these different factors and work out which of these variables was creating the greatest risk for pneumonia. Um, things that we didn't put into the model or didn't have information for are in the red box on the right. Um, and it, it was a shame that we didn't have all the calf uh, health data um, that was really, you know, we were sort of missing half the calves in that, in that window that we got weights for. Uh, but that's just the nature of, and the complexity of recording. One of the big um, things that we sort of all agreed upon was that the, there is not really a strong recording system for calf side health, weight, et cetera, recording that, that is 
that generates a nice simple list of, of history or anything like that that would that we could then use in this way there are recording systems out there um, but they're not always necessarily straightforward to get that data out of so it seems to be a bit of a, a gap in the market for a an app or something where you would have the calf ID and then the, a, a series of drop downs where you could simply record everything and it would spit out a report at the end. Um, in the in the calf group, um, there was one major sort of link, unfortunately, with some of the data is that in the, the feeding system and the housing systems were completely linked. Uh, the all of the calves that were fed on automatic machines were housed in igloos. And all of the calves that were fed uh, through teats, buckets, uh, were housed in traditional sheds. So there was very much a, uh, an interaction there between the two, which, which makes it hard to drill out which is having a, a bigger effect, housing or feeding system. They're interlinked, so we couldn't split them out. Um, so the greatest risk when all of those factors were taken into account was season of arrival on farm with winter and spring posing the greatest risk. Uh, spring 2018 just didn't really ever arrive. It was a very drawn out cold winter. And so the cars were under a lot of stress. Um, other years we might expect autumn and winter to prevent that pre present this, this challenge, but actually in, in this model, in this time period, winter and spring, were by far the worst. Um, but the, the greatest risk of, of pneumonia was arrival, a season of arrival. The next biggest risk was paid by feeding system. Um, but as I said, feeding system and housing were completely intertwined. So very hard to tease those apart. The batch risk category was next. So calves that were coming in, uh, batches that were coming off huge numbers of farms, were in a worse position than calves that were coming in from one or two farms on the batch. Again, not surprising. And and, and breed category was last. So we categorized the Holstein um, bulls uh, against the continental, uh, continental calves. And unfortunately, they came out as being uh, more likely to develop pneumonia. Now, is that a lack of hybrid vigor? Uh, is it uh, a difference in value of the calf and possibly different treatment of farm of origin. Um, it's possible there's lots of factors that could be could be contributing, um, but they definitely had a, um, a greater risk of being treated for pneumonia. Um, as I said, the the once a day feeding and the the, the housing um, types were, were were closely linked to, to the, the the feeding and the housing types were closely linked. So it's very hard to tease these about. I'll tease these apart. Uh, housing and season are really, really important. We can't alter the seasons, but as you know, as I put there at the bottom, you can change your housing. Um, so it's the point, I suppose, is, and the rest of the, this evening's webinar is that season poses the greatest risk of pneumonia, i.e., undesirable weather conditions. So therefore, our focus must be on providing the best conditions in the unfavorable weather conditions. So poor housing um, and ventilation leads to poor air quality. OK, and air quality is everything regarding pneumonia. So poor air quality uh, means basically anything that is an insult to that calf's airway. It could be actual viruses causing disease, could be bacteria. Um, and I think uh, things that are underrated, dust and ammonia, and they will cause actual damage to the to the hairs that line the windpipe um, and other aspects of the airway. And they'll allow in then secondary infections and they'll make it much easier for um, the virus and the bacteria to invade. So poor air quality ultimately is a lack of air turnover or it's poor air quality problems are exacerbated by a lack of air turnover um, and that damages those lungs and allows that calf to develop pneumonia. Um, once calves are over three weeks of age it's the biggest cause of mortality um, certainly in the in the group of calf rear data and in our clients um, aside from a couple of weird and wonderful things um, pneumonia is the biggest cause of mortality under three weeks of age it tends to be scour um, related but 
in a calf beef and calf um, dairy calf rearing environment uh, most of the calves that are in the systems are over three weeks of age so it, getting the housing right really has you know has some potentially some some really good benefits uh, this is uh, a graph which probably people have seen before uh, it's from ken nordland um, university of wisconsin and it shows um, really nicely actually how um, our air quality um, and respiratory disease are linked so in this study they used airborne bacteria counts um, as a measure of air quality and this is the proved way of, of assessing um, air quality so if you look along the bottom axis there um, you've got your lowest bacterial counts on the left and your highest on the right and then up the left hand up at the vertical axis you've got the prevalence of respiratory disease so there's quite a clear trend there that in um, in the instance where you have high levels of bacteria or poor air quality you have an increased rate of pneumonia and then the various different colors and shapes um, that you can see within those lines are then the calves grouped in terms of how they're housed within their pens so if you look at the bottom there you have a good description and those calves that are deep nested and have the presence of a solid barrier so they'd be individually penned and they have loads of straw are are at the least risk of developing pneumonia so they are completely free from draft so they've got presence of a solid barrier they are able to nest deeply and only when air quality really really declines do they develop um, do they are they possible possibly able to develop pneumonia and you can see them here so the deep nesting and the the, the ab absence absence of draft when the air quality is, is really clean there's very little evidence as, as air quality declines to being really bad those only then do those calves come at risk of developing pneumonia so the calves at the other extreme are, are up here so these calves have got minimal nesting and the ability to net you know no ability to nest at all and the absence of a solid barrier so there's there's potential for draft over these calves and that they have no way of protecting themselves from um, the cold so this just shows quite nicely that air quality um, is a bit major driver but the other factors then within that housing environment are are also you know supporting or otherwise you know increasing the risk of developing pneumonia so what of our focus has got to be um, so maximize air quality by ensuring excellent ventilation without a draft and keeping environmental moisture to a minimum minimum so that environmental moisture um, excessive amounts of humidity or environmental moisture will allow calves to chill um, especially in cold weather and potentially they act as uh, the extra moisture in the air acts as a, um, a way of uh, pathogens of viruses and bacteria to transit between calves um, and excessive moisture around the feeding apparatus etc etc um, is normally the source of this um, so our responsibility is to provide good ventilation and reduce that moisture and then to support the calf by providing conditions that allow the calf to stay warm and providing correct dietary calories for growth and immunity at the same time um, and temperature is important um, so this is a, from AHDB's um, how, really useful housing booklet um, so we're looking here at lower critical temperatures um, continental bred steers those steers that are fed a you know a pretty poor energy density diet um, 100 kilogram animals so we're looking at beef from dairy calf size on a, on a relatively low energy density diet the lower critical temperature for those animals is 4.7 degrees lower critical temperature is the, the temperature at which the calf um, uses calories to stay warm instead of growing so if you're not feeding them many calories then they can't put up with much temperature stress is the summary really um, 
if you're uh, and there's a bit of a, a strange position in the middle of this in, in the table where these calves will put up with lower temperatures um, but in summary um, the more calories you feed the lower the temperature the calf will put out put up with uh, very few people will be feeding diets much higher than this um, so if you've got 100 kilo animals then you're not going to then as soon as it gets below zero they're going to be burning calories to stay warm instead of growing and then other things will start to give so their ability to fight infections uh, their immune status etc becomes compromised um, so keeping the calf warm as well as well ventilated is an important important consideration so what does well ventilated mean so that's basically providing enough air changes per hour for the calves uh, historically people sort of discussed four air changes per hour um, but that's been fairly well disproven and you know at least eight to ten air changes per hour even in the winter um, moving to a sort of a maximum of 60 in hot conditions the eight to ten per hour um, in the winter I would say is rarely achieved in a traditional shed environment and when the weather gets cold generally people are closing down sheds and trying to keep the calves as warm as they can um, and then that compromises upon air changes. Um, why do we want air changes? It's removing that poor quality air and that poor quality air is inevitable. Um, calves produce moisture, urine, feces, you're feeding them wet feeds, uh, they uh, it comes through their skin, there is a lot of moisture around um, and uh, that along with ammonia and all the pathogens and dust that we discussed etc that is making poor quality air and that we need to move that away from the calf um, really simple way to assess this using a fogger or maybe smoke bombs um, or creating a you know a wet straw fire in a can in, in, a, in a wheelbarrow somewhere safe in the shed um, it's a really simple way to assess it you start the clock and once everybody's in agreement that it's gone um, that's your air change um, and everybody should be doing that really and, and having a look at what their sheds are like or doing it with someone that has some of that equipment the one of the biggest challenges is getting people to um, allow their calf sheds to ventilate in the winter especially traditional housing um, the, there's a feeling that that obviously we need to wrap calves up and keep them warm which is true they don't want to be cold as we've shown with that lower critical temperature graph but being uh, badly ventilated and not having good air quality as you can see from that graph the Ken Lordland graph that, that we start that we went back um, that we, you know from previous slides actually you know more most important is air quality most important is air quality there's a range of of, of risk associated with um, the nesting etc but if you can ensure you've got the air changes per hour as the primary thing and then provide the straw to nest in or potentially coats for smaller calves or small micro environments for them to to hide in within this cutoff environment if you can provide the air changes primarily then all those other things um, become bonuses so what does well ventilated mean? It means inlet and outlet, space for the air to move into the shed and out of the shed. Um, for every uh, meter squared of inlet space, you need half to 0.25 the amount of outlet or flip that around. Um, for every meter squared of outlet, there must be two to four times, <coughs> sorry, the amount of inlet. Um, and, it's, and it's really basic fluid dynamics. If, it's, if air is flowing out, or if you're expecting air to flow out, you must provide as little resistance as possible for air to flow in behind it. Or, which is what probably should happen in more um, calf rearing environments, especially in traditional sheds, you force air in, and then the air moves out because you're forcing it in using energy. <coughs> So forces of, um, sources of inlet in most calf um, sheds, traditionally naturally ventilated calf sheds, uh, most of the time that's through boarding. So it's a, an imperfect wall, it's a perforated tin, um, or spacer boarding, Yorkshire boarding. Um, in most calf houses, 
Uh, we'll go through the stack effect and things in a second, but in most calf houses, that inlet is acting as outlet as well. And we're looking at really just a cross flow or a, um, areas of the areas of the building where the wind catches the corner and sucks air out of the corner and things like that. And that's how that calf house is ventilating. It would be ventilating very differently on a stilt day to a windy day. The prevailing wind will be affecting the ventilation. So it's yes, there is space for the air to move in and out, um, but it's not predictable. It's not consistent. So on a still day, often those those simply boarded sheds are, are, you know, they're really not ventilating particularly well. If you are putting boarding up, um, and this is Jamie Robertson, um, who's a building's sort of guru, very much a guru, um, he goes on and on about this, uh, and rightly so. If you're putting boarding up, then be clear is it spacer boarding, which is basically a board with a gap, or are you talking about proper Yorkshire boarding? which has two layers of boards um, with a, a space in between them. And then the space on the outer board um, is overlaps with the inner, where the inner board is positioned. And you can see here, you get double the amount of inlet through that board. So Yorkshire boarding is providing a lot more inlet. It also protects the inside of the shed from um, rain really effectively without compromising upon airflow. Obviously, this costs considerably more because you have a lot more wood involved in its construction, uh, but it provides better ventilation. If you're going to specify you'd like Yorkshire boarding, make sure it's Yorkshire boarding rather than space and boarding that you get. Um, other ways of providing inlet uh, or outlet in these um, traditionally uh, naturally ventilated sheds, uh, doorways or windows, but don't forget to open them. Uh, shuttered sides, again, don't forget to open them or close them. Uh, gale breakers, again, don't forget to open them. Um, or potentially force ventilation um, as, a, as a solution. The, uh, all those sort of manual, those manual ventilated uh, methods up above here, they, they're great in, in theory, but time and time again, uh, you know, I go on farm on a, on a still day. Uh, in November, it's not too cold and the calves are shut in and ah, oh, we didn't open the shuttered sides today or we didn't open the blinds today. And, you know, it's it's not automated. It, people are very busy on farm, labour short, etc. And expecting this to be done um, is is perhaps, you know, it's, it's a bit unachievable on some farms. Um, so forced ventilation is often a, a solution. Uh, this is a nice uh, tube set up. Um, yeah, and it's basically the tube was built to fit the shed um, and it's just blowing air onto, those, air onto the calves. It's acting as the inlet and then the outlet is through the perforated tin. Um, we'll go back to this picture later on. Um, there's something that I want to point out in that picture that we could be improved upon. Um, the In this instance here, again, we've got a... Uh, a tube running down the length of the building that's acting as your inlet um, outlet today is really limited so this blind is pulled down and there's a little gap here um, there's some space in the roof but these are these are clear um, panels so and then this isn't perforated tin so you've got you're pumping air into that building using energy um, and it's not really uh, able to escape particularly easily. Something to bear in mind when you're um, putting a, a tube in, if a tube is an option, which we'll talk about a little bit more, um, is that outlet is, you know, thinking about where your outlets are is, is important or, or how that building is going to ventilate. Um, we fought, I fogged a building the other day in, in the, the tube and it was, it was going full pelt. It was actually going too quickly and air was coming out at one end. It wasn't uniformly ventilating the shed which is quite interesting um, and then it was it was sitting and circulating at that one end of the shed and there was simply nowhere for it to get out so you could see the calves were just sitting in waves and waves and waves of the same air that was just being circulated around their heads at one end of the shed and then the, the other end of the shed it was completely still and the calves weren't receiving any air at all um, so it's it's and, and nowhere for anything to escape. So it's still, even though you're pumping air into the shed through the tube, you need to bear in mind that um, it has to get out somewhere. 
So outlet, um, don't over rely upon the stack effect with baby calves. Uh, they just, they really struggle to make it work. Um, they generate very little body heat and the air doesn't rise particularly far above them. So, so the end that you end up with a, a situation with air just circulate, circulating it on top of the calves. Um, the sheds are built with um, outlet in them. You see lots of calf sheds that have got open ridges, etc. cetera. Um, but the, does the air make it up to actually escape through the outlet? quite rarely unfortunately in naturally ventilated sheds um, so one of the solutions is to look at adjustable side walls um, as an option for out inlet and outlet at the same time but these then also need to be managed on a day-to-day -day basis um, so they're not a, so they're not always a solution um, so just a little bit on natural ventilation everybody's seen the stack effect before um, it basically relies upon the the animal's body heat um generating an updraft and then that sucks air in uh, through the inlets at the side of the building. Uh, nice big animals generate a nice big updraft and it all works. Lots of calculations have gone into this over, over the years um, and it can be calculated quite accurately to the body weight of the animal, etc. The floor area, the stocking density, the inlet space, outlet space can all be worked out and it will work. Unfortunately, when you put little tiny bodies that don't generate a huge amount of heat in the, into that same space, uh, the air moves up and then falls down and doesn't ever make it to the roof and it doesn't drive that draw of through the inlet. So you end up with poorly um, naturally ventilated sheds if you're using those calculations for calves. If, um, if you lower the eaves, um, so if you try and stick to the sort of the fluid theory of, you know, driving that that air out of the top of the shed and, and lower the eaves, then it potentially um, there's potential that it, at high stocking densities, it might encourage air to move up and away. But these sheds are, have really, really, really have low eaves and they're very difficult to clean out if they're not designed well um, and often uh, you know, you hear that, well, I hear quite frequently, uh, well, we can't build a shed of that height because what else would we use it for? Well, that's a very good point and he hence, you know, people are hesitant to do this. Um, if you're going to build a bespoke calf building that's just going to be used for calves, um, then would you invest in a shed or would you potentially use some of the other technology um, that's out there? If you're putting up a shed that you'll rear calves in and then use for other things, this is probably not the design but um so what people do instead of having the low um you know going for the low shed and trying to force those animals to create the stack effect what you see most commonly is the same height of shed um, or a usable height of shed and then huge great big inlets cut at the wall so either having um either having flaps here or potentially having blinds here, but basically allowing those calves to ventilate with as much air as you like over the top of them, um, just to get air into the shed, basically. Um, the only challenge with that is that in, in very blustery cold conditions, the calves are potentially at risk of, of really feeling the impact of the cold weather and the wind. So the, so the emphasis has to be on how to minimize this. We talked about variable sides, so options for variable sides, shuttering and blinds. Um, the other potential option is to create a space within that environment. So where you've got plenty of air blowing over them in a really open airy shed. If you've got little calves in there, you need to create a, a cubby hole essentially for them to hide away in. Um, and this is one of the reasons why, you know, the igloos and the large hutches work so well, um, is that they're in a, you know, the calf outside area is really well ventilated and then they have a place where they can hide and get warm um, as and when they need to. They have a choice. If you force calves into these very, very open sheds in cold conditions, they haven't got a choice. They can't hide from the draft. And if they can't nest, then they're going to get chilled and you're going to have negative health effects. All of the calculations and things that you need, I mean, I'm not going to go through that this evening, um, they, they can be found in this really good document, uh, Better Cattle Housing Design, and that details the, the height of the eaves, it details the, um, the outlets 
the inlet, um, a detailed floor space, a stocking density, loads of different factors. So if you're putting up a shed and you want to try to ventilate it naturally, uh, which for baby calves is, is, is not a good idea, but if you want to try to ventilate it naturally, then um, that gives you some guidelines on calculations, etc. Um, so as I've said, often in these naturally ventilated sheds, uh, inlet and outlet are interchangeable. So air is coming through the sides and leaving out of the sides as well. Um, and as we're kind of coming to the summary of really, baby calves of 0 to 12 weeks of age are really difficult to house in these types of sheds. Um, the air doesn't, dynamics don't work as the stack effect doesn't work. They don't drive the airflow out. Um, so calf specific housing, or mechanical ventilation are much better um, options for calves. So mechanically ventilating traditional sheds um, or potentially you know, investing in another option. Um, we have quite a few clients with igloos and we have um, quite a few clients with using large hutches as well, ho housing multiple calves in, um, in you know, small micro calf environments and they do work really well. Um, Basically, it's providing that calf with a space small enough for it to actually generate the heat to move the air away, air away from it. And they're shaped, specifically igloos are shaped fantastically well to pick up um, even small amounts of airflow and to funnel that over its chimneys and draw air out as well. So the calves are the calves are really driving the air movement through these environments. And they can be really humid and, and warm environments, but because the uh, air changes in them are, are relatively high because of the unique design. Um, you know, that humidity is constantly leaving. So even though there can be a bit of a whiff in an igloo, um, air changes per hour are really high. So you're, you're getting rid of that poor quality air um, really quickly. It's warmer than, um, than, than being in an exposed shared environment as well. They're very much, um, you know, they're a very sheltered environment for calves. And they're normally situated where the calf can access an exposed area outside. So it can moderate it can it can moderate its body temperature. If it's hot, it can go outside. If it's cold, it can go inside. It's got a choice, um, and, and therefore it will look after itself. Um, mechanical ventilation is often the only solution um, for calf housing, especially if that shed's been designed or is used for other things as well. Um, you, it's ultimately creating a big inlet and forcing air into the shed, um, allowing to, it to make its way out. Now that may be through the roof, um, given that the uh, most tubes that are pointing directly down at the ground, um, it, most of the outlet actually is through the sides when you start fogging these sheds, it's through sides and gaps um, above, just above calf level rather than the, the ridge itself. Um, and this, the tubes work really, really well when calves are able to nest. So when they're able to, to make themselves warmer, um, you know, so in cold weather, you can achieve good air changes per hour and the calves can stay warm. It, they work really well when coupled with deep straw. So that was what I was going to come back to in this image here is that uh, the tube It's lovely to have a tube and it was running and this was a cold day. Um, but the calves have got relatively little um, they're all bedded on what looks like rape straw. They've got really very little ability to nest. So if we had very cold conditions in this shed, yes, we're getting our air changes per hour, which is great for ventilation, and it should be our main goal, but we're risking the calves chilling here. So if they don't develop disease, if it gets under their lower uh, critical temperature, um, then if they don't develop disease, they will not be growing. So any, you know, any feed you're putting into that animal is not really doing the job um, we want it to. Um, so that was my point there, really. Um, and in that image there, there's more straw. But again, it, it could be better. And if you're forcing if you're forcing air into a shed uh, through mechanical ventilation, you need to provide more straw for that calf to nest in cold conditions. And this is a nice, uh, nice image from Ken Nordland's um, publication on calf housing that I took the graph from. Um, that calf's able to bury its legs. Extremities are really uh, good places for animals, us, calves, any, any animal to lose heat from. So if it can bury its legs, um, then that's a good start for reducing temperature loss. Um, so going away slightly from um, ventilation, another focus of uh, good calf housing is uh, reducing environmental humidity. Um, 
calf housing generally has high levels of environmental moisture. Um, why is that bad? It chills calves in cold temperatures. So a damp, cold environment is really, really, um, you know, is really undesirable. Um, the moisture is often associated uh, with feces and therefore, you, you know, you're in a feces mix, so you get a lot of ammonia in the environment, which is, um, again, it's undesirable um, for lung health and air quality. And, and generally, um, moisture and, and high levels of ammonia, et cetera, are associated with, with reduced air quality. Um, if you've got good air changes per hour and the calves are able to keep themselves warm, then humidity isn't um, and environmental moisture isn't as big an issue. Um, if you've got really low air changes per hour and you've got cold conditions and you've got lots of environmental humidity, um, then there's, you know, we're getting a perfect storm here for some really poorly calves. Um, sources of moisture, the calves themselves, uh, they're on milk, they're consuming large volumes of liquid, that's got to come out somewhere. Um, milk feeders, commonly automatic feeders, can be really, really messy. Um, water troughs, calves just mess about with water troughs. Uh, drinkers, they're better, but they'll still somehow find a way of messing about with them. So all these things are sources of, of liquid in the environment, which you have to cater for um, through either drainage, uh, extra bedding, increased bedding frequency, or you know designs that that are unique and and, and keep moisture away. Um, this is a really nice picture that shows a calf feeder. Um, it's not just been placed there for this photograph, but if you look around the back of the calf um, where it stood, that's a really really clean and dry environment. You see a lot of these, and I haven't got a unfortunately I haven't got a good photo of one. <coughs> You see a lot of these where the calf is stood in a, a wet soup um, of milk, feces and urine. You know, every every time it goes to feed, it breathes in a good guts full of, pneuma, of ammonia, etc. Um, and it, and calves being inquisitive will in, investigate those puddles. Um, and that's obviously not good for transmission of, of other diseases either. So that's just a good example of how they can be kept really nice and clean. Okay, um, so in summary, uh, season prevents uh, calves with the greatest risk of developing pneumonia. So cold, damp, potentially drafty, windy conditions. Um, are, you know, the calves are really up against it in that instance. It's the biggest cause of antibiotic usage uh, in the calf rearing system. And pneumonia is, you know, it's a welfare problem and it presents also presents cost challenges as well in terms of treatment and growth rate etc so in summary from what we've talk, sort of talked about uh you must provide primarily fresh air changed every eight to ten times per minute at least um even in cold even in cold conditions you must protect calves from draft especially in cold conditions we must protect calves from um uh, cold temperatures with bedding, um, coats, or that's meant to say micro environments. <laughs> so a areas where they can hide or um, potentially sheds within a shed, like an igloo or a, a, um, a large hutch, somewhere they can they can get warm. And we must keep environmental moisture to a minimum. So those so those focuses really all um, will provide for a good environment for calf rearing, a good environment for um, air quality and lung health um, and that's you know that's that's really it's very basic a lot of this stuff is from you know years ago and it's still I go out on farm you know on a daily basis and see calves in in either on on dairy farms or in calf rearing environments and still um, there's in, in unsuitable environments out there uh, there are things that can be done I haven't sort of followed made great suggestions about how to alter and improve everyone's sheds um, because it's very bespoke and it's unique to your shed and uh, it's a discussion that you need to have with you know shed designer or vet or somebody you know that you've got that's interested in and understands what they're doing regarding ventilation um, but it's it's really follow it's really just retouching those basics and making sure that we've got them um, will improve the the health um, of calves on farm 
uh, references, I've just put two there. As I said, have a look at that better cattle housing design um, document for AHDB if you're interested. It's a really good, um, really good document. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, so please do type any questions um, if you have any. And I'd like to remind you all that the presentation has been recorded, so it will be available to watch back on the YouTube channel um, probably by tomorrow. Um, I'd also like to highlight some extra resources. So we also have the Better Returns from Calf Rearing Manual and the Improving Beef Housing Manual, which is currently being updated. And the BRP Plus range, they can be found online. Um, so we do have a few questions. The first question is, what is the best or optimum temperature you would house calves at? Um, so different calves of different ages need a different temperatures. So, so calves of sort of naught to four weeks of age, uh, naught to two weeks of age, let's start there, the very smallest calves, uh, their lower critical temperatures are sort of eight to 10 degrees. Um, and then it climbs as that calf gets bigger. So in the dead of winter, it's really hard to cater for those calves without putting a coat on them or putting them within uh, their own little micro environment or you know, bedding them with straws, a bit of a gesture in minus five degrees. Um, it, it really, so focus, uh, the temperature stress on is, is worst on the lowest, on the smallest calves. And then it, it, there isn't an optimum, unfortunately. Um, it's more about size, is be kind of my answer to that question. Thanks, Nick. Um, we've just got a question here. They'd like to see the temperature graph again, please. Could you just flick back? That one? Yes, I, think, I believe that will be it. Thanks, Nick. Or no, the the lower critical temperature. Oh, right. yes, that might be it, that one. Um, we'll leave it there and we'll carry on and see if they've got anything else to ask. Um, going back to the group you worked with with HDB, were all of the calves in the trial BVD tag and tested? No, that's okay. a very good point. So, uh, the... At that point in time, only one of the farms was doing it. By the end, um, I think through discussion with their peers and you know through the discussion with various uh, sort of experts and us just you know sort of feeling our way through it. By the end, I think pretty much all bar one of the group would have, would be engaging in some sort of BVD testing. So okay. really, you know, much better coverage. And that's some of that's through their supply chain and some of that's off the off their own back. Thanks, Nick. Um, and what is the closest distance cattle sheds can be to each other when different sheds are housing mixed ages of cattle to avoid them sharing the same airspace and spreading disease? <laughs> that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very good question. Somebody that knows the answer, I think, has asked that question. Um, I, I, off the top of my head, I don't know. I, I have a feeling. I have a feeling. I've seen eighteen feet um, written down somewhere previously. I can't answer that though. I'm afraid. I really can't. Thanks, Nick. Um, are there any other aspects of housing that we should be considering apart from the the basics that you've mentioned tonight? Uh, so things that perhaps we're not conscious of I think this is something that's important actually so lighting and how how the how sheds are lit not necessarily with 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 bulbs and, and electricity but simply how lights getting in natural lights getting into sheds I think that definitely has an effect upon calf demeanor if you if you've got a sunny day in the winter and you can get sunlight into the shed you know it's it, there's nothing, I don't, perhaps it's just me as a personal, you know, anthropomorphizing calves, but uh, it's nice to see calves lying in the sun on a cold day in the winter. Um, so lighting, how light gets into the shed, um, potentially enrichment for the, in the calf environment. Um, I've not seen any good, um, I've not seen any results of any research that people are doing, but I know people are trying to show that enrichment in the calf environment is a positive thing. Um, and the floor, the floor is really important. 
so that obviously drives your environmental moisture um, the way that the floor drains uh, slats or wooden um, uh, like a wooden uh, slatting system which is quite common under large hutches or, or igloos um, whether it's on concrete which is really really cold um, one of the exercises we did with the calf group actually looked at um, con comparing concrete shed and igloo uh, internal and external temperatures and the concrete sheds took a long long time to warm up after cold periods and that's you know one of the aspect thermal aspects of concrete is that it does cool quite a lot and then it takes a long time to warm so you know th that sort of th those sort of things as well are are to be taken into account but air changes are really the most important thing thanks nick that's really interesting and what are the main diseases that calf rearers that you've been dealing with are seeing at the moment um so um the cool main causes of pneumonia, the, the, the viruses, um, parainfluenza, RSV, um, are you know always present. Um, we see quite a lot of my mycoplasma in the calf rearing environment. Um, that's a real challenge. Um, that's a big cause of antibiotic usage, um, and it's, there's not an, an easy fix. I'm afraid for that. Um, working with the farm of origin as much as possible is probably the best bet um, and then uh, your other bacterial pneumonias um, posturella histophilus those those are key um, you know key bacterial things to consider especially if you're considering vaccination thank you um, and this is our final question unless we get any more through um, but you've talked a lot about temperature should we still be measuring and worried about temperature in store cattle in store cattle, so bigger than if we're looking, if you look on that graph there, uh, the chart that's in front of us there, um, if you're talking about store cattle um, as bigger than sort of 300 kilograms, the um, the store animal here is is able to maintain growth and not not start using calories for to keep warm down to minus seven degrees. Um, so for the vast majority of um and and actually if you think about store size they're going to be between these two probably they're going to be more like 400 so for the vast majority of uk weather conditions temperature in store cattle is really a serious consideration um they're going to be on ration similar to this and they're going to sit somewhere between the two you might get a, a day a couple of days at that low when your store cattle won't grow but it's it, the risk there presented is, is pretty small. Thanks, Nick. We have just had one final question come through. Um, so you've talked about the, the, the best practice is to avoid calves sharing air. So the aim should be to avoid mixing calves from different sources. Is there a critical age at which this becomes less important? For most of the viruses, they, they will mix them relatively young um, and provided they've got they've got immunity from their mothers um, they are they they are able to you know to, to clear that infection relatively relatively easily probably without any clinical signs um, and they're and they're gonna you know go on and have a relatively straightforward path the the problem is that that can happen multiple times for calves on their farm of origin for the various viruses but as soon as you mix those calves with any other farms strain of all the viruses even the common colds um, they haven't got immunity so any mixing of cattle really at any age presents a risk um, they don't they don't gain immunity to diseases that they've never seen they will to some degree because some of the strain variation is is low but for for most of the um diseases they they won't develop a, an immunity necessarily to to john down the roads type of mycoplasma let's say so it's it, it's a challenge mixing cattle from different farm of origin is always going to present a challenge um and you can see that even up to you know we see that in finishers mixing animals from a farm that has IBR and a farm that doesn't have IBR, you think that they're 
out of the woods, you think you're not going to have a problem, 12 months of age plus, um, they're mixed and you have an out IBR outbreak in the animals that came from the farm that didn't have IBR. So there's always a risk um, in mixing cattle, I'm afraid. Thanks, that's really interesting. Um, we are now out of time. That was the last question. So thank you for everybody for listening at home as well. And thanks for presenting tonight, Nick. Um, the recording of this webinar will be emailed in the next day. So in case you would like to recap anything, it will be on email and also on the YouTube channel. So thank you again and have a good evening, everybody. Thank you.